Well, hello, everyone. I hope you've had a, a good day so far and um, that everything is working all right with the lectures. Um, I'm going to now talk to you a little bit about the actual instrumentation for small angle scattering. So we've talked in the various lectures today about some of the theory of scattering, um, some uh, details of how we calculate what the scattering would look like, uh, form and structure factors and so on, some things about how we make use of chemical variation to, uh, to highlight and hide different parts of our sample. Um, and so now I'm going to talk uh, about, as I say, the, the details of what uh, small angle scattering instruments uh, are actually made up of and how we actually embody them in a way that allows us to make these measurements. So just a reminder of what of a summary of what I said this morning. Um, you know, what do we measure in a SANS experiment? I spoke in a general sense this morning, but in the SANS experiment in particular, um, we are interested only in the uh, correlations in space. So we're interested in the structure of our sample um, on the nanometer to micrometer length scale. And so what we do is we have our instant beam and we measure the number of uh, neutrons that are scattered as a function of Q. And you'll see when we talk about how we design the instruments, the different ways that we go about enabling us to do that. Um, uh, as you, you'll have heard from Wojtek, so then basically we can then take the information we have uh, where we have intensity as a function of Q and we can uh, use that to determine uh, the shape and size of particles in solution or particles in a, in a matrix or determine information about the, the structure of our sample in general. Um, just remind you that, that Q ends up as being an inverse space. It's the Fourier transform. So we end up with uh, inverse space, which means that smaller Q values mean uh, measuring larger structures in real space. So the bigger things we want to measure, the smaller Q values we need to measure at. And here I've been saying that we're only interested in the variation as a function of Q. But this morning I said that, you know, we could also measure the variation as a function of omega, which is the uh, energy transfer. Uh, so, so what's happened to that in a small angle scattering experiment? Um, in uh, sort of conceptualizing it, and when I gave the, the, the explanation of scattering from a single nucleus, I worried only about elastic scattering and completely ignored any energy transfer. Of course, in the real world, uh, the atoms and molecules and neutrons that we fire at them uh, don't ignore uh, inelastic scattering or quasi-elastic scattering. And so that still happens. But fundamentally, what we're doing in a small angle scattering experiment is we're essentially integrating over all energy transfers. Uh, so rather than doing a, actually doing an elastic measurement, what we're actually doing is we are uh, integrating over all of the inelasticity. So if you imagine if we have something like this quasi-elastic uh, system here, essentially when we, we say we have uh, some amount of uh, uh, momentum transfer uh, with a zero energy transfer, what actually we're doing is we're integrating about omega equals zero uh, to, get that, um, uh, to get that signal. And this is an important difference in the fact that if it was purely elastic, then we wouldn't have to worry ever about uh, non-elastic scattering. Um, however, in the real world, we do. Uh, and this leads to uh, some effects uh, and actually is a big contributor to the background signal. So the incoherent inelastic scattering uh, is actually quite a large component of the background from hydrogenous materials. Um, but just that's really just a conceptual thing to, to, to bear in mind while we're, we're talking about the instrumentation. For all intents and purposes, the interesting bit of the, the data, the coherent part, can be treated as being purely elastic. All right, so what does a SANS instrument look like? Uh, it looks uh, something like this. Uh, we have a source, we have some uh, means of transporting the radiation from the source. Uh, we have a means of choosing what wavelength we're going to use. We have some means of collimating the beam. Uh, we have our sample and we have a detector. And these are all placed uh, controlled distances um, apart. And this is the same whether we're measuring with the neutrons or x-rays. Uh, 
the details of the, the components may be different, but the principles are fundamentally the same in terms of what those components do. Uh, but today I'm just going to talk about um, uh, uh, small angle neutron instruments. So we can begin with the very simplest SANS instrument we could think about building. Indeed, these were, in fact, some of the first SANS instruments that were built. You would place the collimation directly outside the, uh, the reactor uh, shielding um, and uh, then have a sample and detector. Um, so we have collimation uh, because we want to measure at small angles. If we had no collimation, then, of course, the, the, the neutrons would be spreading out in all directions and we wouldn't be able to measure any divergence of the beam. So the only way we're able to measure divergence of the beam from uh, straight is by making the beam straight to start with. And that's what the collimation does. Um, from the previous things, you, you, will, you, know, you noted that um, the wave vector Q is given by four pi on lambda times the sine of the scattering angle or half the scattering angle, depending on how you choose to define it. Um, and what this means is, if we remember that lower Q means larger structures, is that there are two different ways we can achieve uh, measuring larger and larger structures. And that is either we can increase this distance L2. So we increase the distance between our sample and detector. And this allows us to discern smaller and smaller angles um, uh, with respect to the direct beam, uh, just through simple geometry or we could choose to measure with longer wavelengths, um, which again uh, would, allow, would reduce the Q vector we were measuring at and thus uh, allow us to measure uh, larger structures. Um, in general, the technique is called small angle scattering because we are always measuring at small angles. And by small here, we generally say that the scattering angle is less than 45 degrees. And 45 degrees is pretty wide. Uh, whereas if you were looking at a pure diffraction instrument to look at uh, the atomic structures, you'd be talking about having detector banks at 90 degrees and greater angles. That's all very well and good. Uh, I mentioned that we can make L2 longer in order to get to lower uh, Q. Um, but I also said we could get a longer wavelength to go to lower Q. So we obviously need some form of uh, managing the wavelength. And so we put in our wavelength selection device, which is purple in this picture. Um, and then we put in uh, various pieces of neutron guide and optics. And you might be wondering why we need this. Well, the simple answer is if we just have our source, uh, then the intensity, the neutrons are given off in all directions. So the intensity of radiation uh, would diminish uh, with R squared. Uh, in order to um, uh, improve the uh, count rate and be able to put the uh, instrument further away from the source of neutrons and thus fit more instruments around the source of neutrons, we make use of um, various types of neutron optics, in particular neutron guides, to transport the neutrons from the source to where we want them. Um, and this effectively moves the source uh, out from where we actually produce the neutrons to where we want to start the instrument. And if we want to measure uh, as much uh, Q space as possible, then uh, we might want to measure with uh, multiple detectors. And this is fairly common now on SANS instruments, as people are building new ones and upgrading old ones, is to add a second bank of detectors so that we can measure uh, at more angles at the same time. If you remember back, I said that you know one of the, 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 the differential cross section is given by uh, the number of scattered neutrons in a given direction divided by the total number of incident neutrons per second. Um, so we need a means of determining how many neutrons per second are actually hitting our sample. Uh, and then how, what fraction of those are scattered. Um, and so we have here a, a series of, um, excuse me, series of beam monitors um, that allow us to uh, measure those. Uh, and then we also uh, potentially have what we call a beam stop in front of the rear detector so that our detector isn't overloaded by measuring all of the unscattered neutrons. And then around it all, uh, we put some form of uh, radiation shielding. 
uh, designed suitably uh, depending upon the shape of the instrument and geometry and uh, the uh, uh, type of source that we have. So that's the pictorial view of uh, what a uh, stands instrument looks like. And now I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we actually uh, go about uh, using the sources that we have. So we talked this morning about different types of neutron source. We talked about reactors, uh, primarily about reactors and spallation sources. So reactors essentially are on all the time. Uh, once the chain reaction has started and it's up and running, it's a continuous source of neutrons uh, until it's chosen to be shut off. In the case of a spallation source, they are intrinsically pulsed. So you make pulses of uh, protons that hit the target, and then that produces pro uh, pulses of neutrons. The ICS spallation source runs at 50 hertz. Uh, SNS runs at 60 hertz. Uh, those are traditionally because the, they were traditionally locked to the, uh, the mains frequency in the country. Um, uh, ESS will actually operate at 14 hertz. Uh, and um, the second target station, for instance, at uh, ISIS uh, takes one pulse in five, so actually operates at 10 hertz. And so we get pulses uh, spaced out in time. So what does this mean in terms of how we can use those for making small angle scattering measurements? So in the case of a reactor, we have this situation. We have all of the neutrons coming out of the source. Uh, they travel to our instrument. We do some wavelength selection, which cuts down the intensity because these are basically all wavelengths. And then we choose some wavelengths. Uh, and then those neutrons are scattered and arrive at the detector. So we're using some of the neutrons uh, essentially all of the time. So what we do in the uh, spallation source case is we have an intrinsically pulsed source uh, so neutrons are produced for a short period of time. They come in bursts. Um, and we have all of the neutrons, uh, different wavelengths produced at, in this period. What happens then is that uh, the longer wavelength neutrons uh, are slower. They have lower energy. So they take longer to get to the end of the instrument. So they arrive later in time than the neutrons that have shorter wavelengths and go faster. And so what that means is that by knowing when the neutrons were produced, and knowing when they arrive at the detector, uh, we know how far apart these two things are, uh, and we know the parameters of the neutron, so we can work out what the neutron's velocity was by the time it took to get from here to here, and that allows us to know its energy and thus its wavelength. Um, and so what this means is that we can now make use of all of the neutrons, uh, but we're only using them for some of the time. So uh, the, there are times when we're not producing neutrons compared to uh, that on a uh, uh, reactor. In both cases, we still measure scattered intensity as a function of Q. Um, with, in the case of the monochromatic uh, or continuous source version, we have to measure at different angles to get to, to these access, these different Q values for a given wavelength. We can choose to measure a different wavelength, and then that's a separate measurement. But in one measurement, we measure at one fixed wavelength uh, and make use of varying angle. Whereas with a time of flight instrument, we simultaneously have multiple wavelengths and we can measure at multiple angles. So in general, uh, the time of flight allows us to measure a much wider range of Q values at the same time. Uh, but in general, we will have fewer total neutrons uh, in, uh, for, uh, uh, at any given wavelength than we will for that wavelength uh, in the uh, monochromatic case. We can also uh, turn a continuous source into a um, pulsed source by making use of what we call a neutron chopper. It's basically a spinning disk with a hole in it. And depending on how fast we spin this disk, we can choose uh, what spacing we want of these uh, pulses. Um, and that's often uh, uh, done in order to deliver this uh, enhanced uh, simultaneous Q range uh, at um, uh, continuous sources. Uh, excuse me, can I ask you a question there Certainly. in the previous? Uh, uh, so then for uh, using chopper, we don't necessarily choose the 
neutrons with a higher velocity, right? No, right. So, so I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how the different technologies work. But essentially, um, with um, with a chopper, you can adjust it uh, on a on a continuous source. You can set it to whatever speed you like to produce pulses uh, at that frequency, um, and there you will be getting whatever um, uh, range of you're producing, or you're still getting all of the neutrons that way. You're, the first chopper will not uh, do any wavelength discrimination. Uh, okay, so yes, uh, yes. The reason that I asked the question was that uh, we said we are interested in larger wavelengths for sense, right? Yes. To get, uh, so then uh, we then we want the neutrons with a lower velocity because- That's right, exactly, yes. So, so then uh, what we do, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but how we do the wavelength selection is we have okay. different choices so this is about generating the source, right? And so yes. in both, all these cases, we have all of the neutron wavelengths that come off our moderator, more or less. Um, we then, in the instrument, have to make a choice about which wavelengths we want. And there are different ways of doing that, which I'll talk about in a moment. OK, thank you. All right, so I mentioned before neutron guides. Um, uh, this is how we actually take the neutrons from the source, be it the reactor or the splation source, and get them out where we can make use of them. So um, uh, these make use of total reflection of uh, neutrons from thin layers of nickel uh, and other materials, sometimes uh, nickel titanium, uh, multi-layers, um, or various other materials, depending on the properties you want, um, on a glass or metal substrate. And those of you who, do, who are working in uh, reflectometry groups will be well familiar with uh, this concept of uh, uh, total reflection. Um, for neutrons in that um, just like with light, uh, where you can get total internal reflection in something like an optic fiber by having different refractive indices, we can do exactly the same with neutrons in the fact that uh, if we put neutrons onto the surface below the critical angle for that given wavelength, uh, then we get uh, a reflection. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the ref uh, reflection is related to uh, the uh, scattering density difference of the uh, interface uh, with, uh, with air and the substrate. Um, and so here one can construct complicated uh, multi-layers to improve the reflectivity uh, or even, uh, and we can also make different shapes of guides to be selective about which neutrons will actually meet the critical angle condition uh, in order to be transmitted. The next thing we have to do is actually choose the neutron wavelength. And there are a number of different ways we can do that. Um, uh, if you, the sort of classical way uh, is to use a monochromating crystal. So here we take something that has uh, an ordered atomic structure and make use of Bragg diffraction to select only the wavelengths uh, or wavelength that meets the Bragg condition at a given angle. So we can make use of different materials with different D spacings. Um, and then align them in the right way with our neutron beam to give us uh, different wavelengths. And we use various different materials. We use um, uh, graphite, we use copper, um, we use um, uh, various uh, other materials such as sapphire and diamond have been used. Um, but for neutrons uh, with the long wavelengths, we generally want something like graphite that has a large spacing um, is, is preferred. Um, uh, or we can use something like silicon, and this is used in some of the instruments I'll talk about when I talk about USANs uh, later in the week. So here's an example where uh, if we take the one on one plane of silicon, that has a D spacing of 3.136 angstroms. Uh, and if we choose a takeoff angle of 90 degrees, so that's two theta is 90 degrees, um, then uh, we will get. Uh, from the first order peak, uh, a wavelength of 4.4 uh, angstroms transmitted. Um, now this is um, uh, very good, but uh, it's very specific. And the more perfect the crystal is, the narrower that wavelength range is going to be. And so what we end up with is, uh, we end up with a very, very specific, carefully defined wavelength, but we've thrown away an awful lot of neutrons. 
The other thing we can do is actually filter out the neutrons we don't want. So the previous example was only letting through the neutrons we do want. So only the neutrons we do want end up being diffracted into the instrument. Um, in this case, uh, we can use um, things called filters to get rid of unwanted wavelengths. Um, usually for SANS, this means we cut out the fast or thermal neutrons, the ones we don't want, those, those higher energy ones that were mentioned before, uh, and allow the longer wavelength, slower ones to pass through. So the common thing to use on a SANS instrument is actually a nitrogen called uh, beryllium filter. Um, this has a cutoff at wavelengths below four angstroms, so it passes four angstroms and above. Uh, another popular choice for SANS instruments is to make a new use of a neutron guide with a particular shape. Um, and this is then controlling uh, which wavelengths of neutrons will actually meet the total reflection criterion uh, by shaping the guide. Um, and so uh, that then provides a cutoff in, um, uh, in wavelength. Um, in particular, curved guides or multi-channel benders and optical filters are all examples of these devices. And fundamentally, they all work in the same way. You're manipulating the shape of the optics such that the angles uh, are controlled uh, as, to, as to which uh, angles are possible for a neutron to reflect at. And then, uh, so here's another example of a filter. This is sapphire. And you can see this is the attenuation curve. So you can see that whilst we do a good, uh, a very a strong attenuation at very short wavelengths, uh, there is still also some attenuation at long wavelengths. And so uh, something like sapphire is not terribly optimal if you want to use, say, something like eight or 10 angstrom neutrons, but can be quite good is if, if you're actually interested in uh, three or four angstrom neutrons. The most common way of actually choosing uh, the neutron wavelength for an experiment on a continuous beam source uh, like a reactor sans instrument is what's known as a velocity selector. Um, and this is a rotating device that's either made up of blades around a drum or a series of discs stacked together. Um, and it has it's made of absorbing materials with gaps in. Uh, and the gaps are arranged helically around the, the, the a cylinder. And what this means is that depending on the speed you rotate that drum at, as the neutrons come through, uh, they will, uh, they might, they'll see, they'll see a gap, and then if they have the right velocity, as this rotates, they will still see a gap, still see a gap, still see a gap, still see a gap, and make it all the way through. If they have the wrong velocity, uh, they will either hit, they'll hit the absorbing edge on one side or the other. And so, by varying the uh, speed of rotation of a velocity selector we can actually change what wavelength we pick. So most SANS instruments will allow you to choose somewhere between four and 20 angstroms. Um, and that's all done by varying the uh, rotation speed of the velocity selector. And you can see here, uh, this is the equation that determines what uh, uh, wavelength gets transmitted. And it's dependent upon exactly how long uh, the velocity selector is, the size of the gaps, uh, and the speed at which we rotate at. The last mechanism we have is what I mentioned before, and this is a chopper. This is sort of like a dumb velocity selector in the fact that it's a single disc with a, uh, usually with one, possibly uh, more gaps in depending on the design of the instrument, but usually just one gap. Uh, and so basically it rotates and uh, on a pulsed source, uh, well, you can use it to either generate a pulsed pulses, and then use further choppers to refine that, or you have a pulsed source. What you have to do is you set it up such that it's synchronized with the pulse pulses so that uh, only neutrons that have, have the right velocity by the time they get to the uh, chopper see an open window. Everything else uh, will uh, hit the absorbing part of the chopper. And so by varying the phase of the chopper in relation to the source, you can vary which, uh, what wavelengths get passed through. By having different sized openings on the chopper uh, window, uh, you can vary the range of wavelengths that are passed through. Uh, and if we look in more detail at how a, a chopper works, uh, we use what we call time distance diagrams or distance time diagrams, depending upon your, your preference, to visualize the chopper operation. 
So along the, this is uh, as the, the uh, uh, example of a potential chopper setup for an instrumented ESS. So here we have a neutron pulse 14 times a second, so every 71.4 milliseconds. Um, and the pulse uh, is here. What we have is then neutrons are spreading out in time, all of the neutrons. Um, but we have our chopper set up with this particular opening in it and rotating such that uh, it's open at this time and closes at this time. So the front edge of the hole opens and then passes across the guide and then uh, the, the, the trailing edge passes across the guide and, and then only absorbing is material is in front of the guide. And this is rotating at the same frequency as the source in this case. So it's rotating at 14 Hertz. So here we can see the fastest neutrons come from the source here. They go up here and they pass through. And then the slowest neutrons also come up and pass through here. And you might think, well, we only need one chopper to do this. Uh, but in practice, if we only had one, then you can imagine that would be some very long wavelength neutrons from here could go all sneak through over here, right? Um, so what we do is we then have a second chopper, which we usually call a frame overlap chopper. Um, we call this first one a bandwidth chopper and the second one an overlap chopper. Um, what happens here is that the, uh, the neutrons uh, can appear and then they also can pass through the second chopper. Any neutrons that are coming at a longer wavelength, so here, even if they get through this one, they're going to be stopped by this one. Um, uh, and uh, the key thing about a time distance diagram is the nice thing is that then the slope of the lines is the neutron velocity and so is directly proportional to the wavelength. Um, and uh, we can do various calculations of what the uh, time of flight is uh, for a given neutron uh, and uh, work out then uh, what the open, uh, opening time for a chopper needs to be to pass a certain wave range of wavelengths through. And in practice, these choppers can be made up of two disks next to each other. And the relative phasing of those disks can be varied to change the opening size. So we can actually change the bandwidth as well as choosing where exactly it is in respect to the uh, neutron pulse. So we have a lot of control over both what wavelength we choose and what range of wavelengths we choose for our time of flight measurement. And we can do some really complicated things where we can take a pulse and we can make lots of small pulses from it, even at a pulsed source. Um, but I won't go into that in any detail, but just to say that, that there are a lot of complicated and cl clever things we can do with choppers uh, to make the most of uh, the, the instrument uh, geometry. All right, now we move on here really to the heart of a SANS instrument. And this is actually the bit of SANS instrumentation that as an experimentalist, you might become most familiar with because this is the primary tool you have to vary the configuration of the instrument and determine uh, the balance you get between flux, resolution, and minimum Q. So um, we have a set of pinhole apertures. These are either uh, actual sort of holes in uh, disks of absorbing material or adjustable slits that are made of absorbing material that we can make apertures from. Um, and we use this to determine the minimum accessible Q value. That's the primary tool we have. In an ideal world, we would have our source aperture. We would then have a, a, an actual pinhole at the sample, and we would image that source aperture on our detector. This would give us the smallest possible uh, scattering angle. So what we, the smallest angle we could determine is then the difference between uh, this half, half of this angle and uh, a little bit further over. However, unfortunately, if we do this, um, we would have an infinitely small uh, pinhole and infinitely few neutrons. So in the real world, we have to increase the size of this sample uh, aperture. Um, in fact, we have finite sized samples. Um, and as we increase this, you'll see we now have this penumbra, uh, as we call it, of uh, neutrons that are passing uh, uh, through uh, different uh, uh, path lengths. And we see that the uh, shape of the beam becomes more trapezoidal. Um, and then what we get to is what we say is the optimum uh, configuration for a SANS instrument. And this is where 
the uh, source aperture uh, is twice the diameter of the sample aperture. And this, we call this the optimum because this uh, is the condition under which we get maximum number of neutrons for the same uh, width of the uh, full width half maximum of the, of the beam. And the full width half maximum of the beam is important because that determines our ability to, uh, to, to know how, to, to how well we can measure the scattering angle. If you've ever done microscopy, you'll be familiar with the point spread function, uh, which gives you the uncertainty uh, and thus the, um, the limit of resolution of a um, uh, optical microscope. Um, this is essentially a similar thing for us in the fact that we can't know our angle any better than the full width half maximum of our beam. That's the best we can determine uh, the, the angle. Um, and so um, when you set up an instrument, you have a choice between uh, improving resolution, that's making the full width half maximum smaller. Uh, and you can do this by changing the distances or by changing the aperture sizes. Or you can increase that and relax the resolution and go for as many neutrons as possible. Um, the thing to note is that as you relax the resolution, you also uh, change the minimum Q value that you can measure at. So uh, when you go for very long collimation distances with very small pinholes in order to get to very small Q values, so that's making sine theta as small as possible, um, then uh, you end up also reducing the flux. Thankfully, um, as you'll have seen today, the scattering intensity goes up significantly uh, as you go to lower Q values uh, in most cases. And so um, you, you, you don't lose as much intensity as uh, it first appears. And there's an equation here that you can use uh, to figure out what uh, the diameter of the beam will be given all the other parameters. All right, how do we actually go about uh, detecting neutrons? Um, one of the advantages of neutrons, and, and we sort of touched on it earlier, but, but, but not in great detail, is the fact that they're very weakly interacting with matter. Um, this is why we see they have small cross sections for many elements um, and, um, and can pass through materials like metals and allow us to uh, see inside. This also means that with this weak interaction, uh, they have a very simple form of interaction potential with the nucleus. And this allows us to do those calculations of, um, of form factors and so on and scattering lengths in a, and do modeling of, of neutron uh, scattering in a relatively straightforward manner. However, this is a significant problem if we actually want to detect them. I mentioned this morning that uh, we have very few neutrons. We have a low intensity of sources. And so we really want to make sure that we're counting as many of them as possible. Thankfully, um, there are a number of elements that undergo nuclear reactions with a neutron and produce detectable products. Um, the ones we use in uh, detectors are uh, boron-10, lithium-6, helium-3, and gadolinium-157. And then you can see their uh, reactions and reaction products uh, in the, the, the top right. And in general, so what we do is we use these uh, materials to generate something that can be detected. So generate something that's strongly interacting, usually a charged particle. Um, and uh, the absorbing material, the boron, lithium, helium, or gadolinium, uh, can be gaseous or solid or uh, solid or, or even liquid uh, in the case of scintillator detectors. Um, and uh, the most common detectors used on SANS are actually um, proportional counters uh, containing helium-3. So what this it happens, it, here, how this happens is the neutron interacts with uh, the helium, produces charged particles. Uh, these ionize the uh, uh, gas mixture um, and uh, produce a cascade of uh, charge. Uh, which can then be detected on a series of wires or a single wire in the case of a tube uh, detector. And then you can work out where the charge was collected on those wires and that tells you where the neutron was detected. 
Um, and so by then knowing where your detector is in space uh, and knowing where on the detector the neutron was detected, uh, we can calculate the angle of scattering from the sample and determine Q. And then we just count the number of neutrons uh, as a function of position on the detector. Then that allows us to get number of neutrons scattered as a function of Q. In the case of um, uh, solid detectors, uh, like many of the boron 10 detectors that we're deploying at ESS, the principle is similar. Uh, you have um, the bore, a very thin boron layer, uh, the neutron interacts with it, uh, and it, the layer of boron is thin enough such that the reaction products can escape. They then ionize a gas, which produces a charge cascade, in uh, which we can detect in various ways. Um, Lithium is largely used in scintillator detectors. And here what happens is that uh, the lithium is mixed in a glass with something like zinc sulfide. Um, and the uh, zinc sulfide uh, will scintillate, namely it will produce light uh, when the reaction products from the neutron lithium-6 reaction interact with it. Uh, and we can then measure the light intensity uh, and use that to localize where the neutron was detected. Uh, and then the gadolinium detectors work in a similar way. They generally produce a gamma uh, ray, which can be used to ionize gas uh, and, uh, and, and, measure, um, and, and measure where the neutron was detected. <clears throat> in general, um, uh, lithium and gadolinium are used in their solid state. As I said, helium is obviously gaseous in this case. Uh, boron 10 is an interesting one. We use it in uh, the solid form these days. But historically, um, boron trifluoride uh, was used widely as a detection gas in, um, uh, in neutron detectors. Um, it's fallen out of favor, as any of you who um, have done any um, uh, fluoride chemistry might suddenly be aware, in that when it interacts with any moisture, so if there's a leak and it interacts with moisture in the air, uh, it produces hydrogen fluoride, um, which is uh, generally not a very nice thing to have uh, floating around in the air. And so it's sort of uh, become um, less popular as a detect uh, gas as a detection uh, fluid, although it is uh, detection gas. Sorry, uh, it is um, rather uh, a um, uh, rather a very it's a very good detection gas, though the chemical problems uh, stop us from using it. <clears throat> so I said that we we count the number of neutrons. There are two different ways of doing this. Um, the traditional way is to build up histograms. So basically you uh, store a histogram in, in equipment memory of where in, in space it, the neutron was detected and the time of flight, if that's relevant. And then we process these histograms to produce the reduced data set. Um, the advantage of this was that it was, it's, it's uses fixed storage. So um, older detector electronics uh, were able to, to do this in, in solid state memory. Um, but, uh, but it, it, you choose up front um, uh, what your histogram uh, looks like. Um, more recently, we've moved with uh, enhancements in both networking and speed of electronics and data storage to what we call event recording. And here, essentially, every uh, neutron detection event is stored in individually. And then these uh, collection of neutron events can be processed into histograms uh, in QSpace to be turned into our final data set. This has the advantage that you can choose after the experiment how you want to cut up your data. So if you need higher Q resolution, uh, you can choose to do that with worse statistics in each um, Q bin. Uh, if, there was, if there's some one particular area of the data where you want to have higher resolution, uh, particularly on a time of flight uh, instrument, you can choose to only use some neutrons and not others. Um, and you have much more flexibility in how you can slice up the data. This also makes time resolve measurements much easier because you can simply just start counting uh, and then afterwards decide how you want to slice up your data in, in time uh, once you see what it looks like. The last topic I'm going to cover now is that of shielding. So um, why do we need radiological shielding? And that's a question to you all. So I want to see some hands up. Can anybody give me some reasons why we need radiological shielding? Anybody think of any? <clears throat> 
Is it for safety? Yes, absolutely. And uh, what what are we trying to keep safe? <laughs> Humans. Yeah, we're trying to keep people safe, right? So uh, we know that um, uh, radiation can cause damage to uh, the human body. Uh, and apparently my slides aren't staged, so I've given you the other answers now. Um, but also it can cause damage to uh, equipment uh, and also it can cause problems with our, our data. We get background from our data. So if we look at the effect that it has on the human body, and this is the one thing that, that most people think about when they think about, uh, about radiation and the risks associated with it. Um, we, in Europe, uh, we use the sievert as the measure of um, uh, a dose uh, of radiation received by the human body. Um, this has the units of joules per kilogram. However, it's not a pure energy deposition. Um, there are uh, biological damage factors which are published by the International Commission on Radiological Protection uh, based upon uh, uh, studies and evidence from people who have been exposed to radiation uh, as to what effects uh, different types of radiation, different energies of radiation uh, have on different parts of the body. And so uh, there is, it is the, you take the, the energy deposition and you modify it by a, uh, this dose factor. Um, to give you a feel for the size of the units, um, the sievert is a very large unit of radiation. Um, so the natural background radiation um, in general is around one millisievert per year is the dose you would receive from just natural background radiation. It's maybe slightly higher in Sweden if you have a basement and spend a lot of time in it, or if you live in one of the rockier areas because of radon. Um, but fundamentally, it's, it's, it's on that order. Um, less than five millisieverts per year is defined as minimum control necessary. And this is the range we operate for users of neutron facilities. In fact, our goal is to, in fact, our design goal is uh, a maximum exposure uh, of one millisievert per year, so equivalent to background. Um, and uh, we take strict measures to ensure that uh, users of the facilities are not exposed to higher levels of radiation than that. Um, in the five to 15 millisievert range is what we call professional exposure. And this is where um, uh, people who work at the facilities generally uh, fall into this category since we're working there all the time, whereas visitors come there less frequently. Um, and this means that we have regular checkups and, and the like just to uh, uh, test our health. Um, and then we go into the range of 15 to 50 millisieverts where strict dose, and dose control is necessary. And this is uh, often where if we have to do work on uh, instrument components that have been irradiated, uh, we have to plan that work very carefully. Uh, we have to do calculations of uh, what dose somebody might receive by doing that hands-on work. And then we have to strictly limit their time as well as providing them with the appropriate um, personal equ protective equipment and uh, training in order to, to do that work safely. And 50 millisieverts per year is the ap absolute upper uh, range of uh, occupational dose. So uh, no workers are allowed to be routinely exposed to more than 50 millisieverts per year as part of their job. Um, if you're exposed to more than 50 millisieverts per year, you require immediate medical checks. Um, and you notice we're still in the milli range. These are thousands of sieverts. It's only once we jump up to a whole sievert that we are starting to talk about the a serious to lethal range of dose. Um, and once you're up to about three and a half sieverts, or, uh, your chances of survival of uh, that dose become very low. Um, and so as you can see, we keep the um, uh, exposure that, that users of facilities have, and even the staff, down to extremely low levels by design. And an important part of designing a neutron instrument is doing the calculations to figure this out. On the other hand, uh, we also worry about our equipment. Uh, 
Um, so uh, a lot of the equipment is things that we will actually have to put very close to or actually in the neutron beam in order to uh, operate the instrument. Uh, think things like the beam monitors and the detectors and so on. And so the electronics for that will be very close to the beam and potentially in the scattered beam. Uh, here we make use of the gray as the unit. And this really is just energy deposited in joules per kilogram. And you can see in this table that different types of materials have different um, radiation tolerances. So um, uh, material like Kapton, uh, which is polyamide film, uh, has a very high um, um, resistance to uh, radiation. And as such, we often use this uh, in uh, neutron detectors as a support for circuits and things like that and detection elements. Um, whereas your general electronic components, things like um, uh, microchips and stuff, are very intolerant. And um, uh, these um, uh, single event failures are actually something that is tested at some neutron facilities. So um, when, when electronics are, you know, people say, you know, military spec or military grade or aviation grade or whatever, these are um, devices that have been tested and designed to be uh, tolerant to uh, single event upsets. So where a neutron, usually a cosmic uh, ray in the real, in, in the outside world, um, uh, hits it, uh, it will cause something in the, the, the chip to go wrong as it changes uh, uh, maybe a bit in memory or changes uh, the way one of the logic gates works. Um, and so uh, if you're putting things in airplanes or safety critical devices or sending them up into space, then uh, their tolerance to radiation is very important. Uh, in our case, generally, we make sure that we just put shielding boxes around the uh, electronic components or keep them as far away from the neutron beam as possible. And then the final one is our experimental data. The pro problem that we have is that um, I mentioned before that you know neutrons are difficult to detect and we come up with uh, design, careful designs for our detectors to detect them. And so the problem is that if we have neutrons that haven't gone through our sample and aren't the ones we want to measure, we'll still detect them. The neutron doesn't know, the, the detector doesn't know where they've come from. It just knows it's a neutron. Um, and so this actually turns out to be usually the most stringent requirement on shielding. Because our detectors are so sensitive for detecting neutrons, um, this is usually about uh, 100 times more stringent a requirement on the shielding than the safety uh, component, um, in terms of neutrons anyway, um, and sometimes in terms of the, the gamma radiation, although we can mostly discriminate that on the detectors. Um, so uh, as an instrument builder, we spend a lot of time, uh, well, the first thing we have to do is satisfy people that we're not going to injure anyone. We then need to make sure that our equipment is going to last. And then uh, we spend most of our time, those are relatively straightforward to fix. And then when we're operating the instrument, we spend an awful lot of time trying to work out where neutrons are coming from that we weren't expecting. So what do we do to actually shield ourselves against neutrons? Uh, and again, we use um, uh, materials that will absorb or uh, scatter neutrons. Uh, and ideally we use mixtures of materials that do both. Um, so we use materials such as uh, concrete, um, which contains um, uh, hydrogen amongst other things um, and uh, will attenuate uh, the, the beam. We use steel, um, we use um, lead to attenuate, attenuate gamma rays, and we use boron uh, in many forms. We use uh, boron carbide uh, in various different forms, powders um, mixed in with epoxy resin, uh, to shape it, um, formed into uh, sintered uh, ceramic tiles as B4C. Um, even these days, uh, mixed into um, polymers and 3D printed. Um, uh, and, and we use these uh, cross sections that you see down here to allow us to attenuate the neutron beams. And what this means is that around a neutron instrument, you will usually see um, quite a lot of thick shielding. Um, this is usually less at reactors than at spallation sources. The reason for this is that spallation sources often have a lot of much higher energy neutrons uh, coming down the, 
beam, uh, beam line than you get at a reactor. And so you end up with larger shielding. Um, and also because, um, uh, because of the spallation source, you end up with a larger background of high energy neutrons that you need to stop as well. So uh, to wrap up, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about uh, SANS instruments around the world and where you could actually go and get your hands on one of these things uh, to do an experiment. <clears throat> and there are neutron sources uh, all over the world. And if there's a neutron source, you can almost guarantee that it has a SANS instrument. SANS instruments are very versatile, um, given that they measure material structure on nanometer to micrometer length scale, um, which is a key uh, length scale for materials properties. Um, it's uh, not surprising that um, they're very popular, uh, both in terms of um, uh, their application, but um, also in terms of uh, uh, the choice to build them. Um, and you can see that in Europe, we have quite a few. Oh. In Europe, we have quite a few. Uh, unfortunately, with the closure of LLB and uh, HZB, um, we have uh, lost uh, quite a few SANS instruments. Although with LLB, they are planning to uh, uh, move a SANS instrument to uh, ILL and one to PSI. Uh, so those will, uh, those will be rehoused and uh, will get a new life. Um, and, um, but, but you can see that even some of the uh, uh, smallest reactor sources uh, will have a SANS instrument. And so there's plenty of choice of where you can go to do your experiments. Right, so just to summarize, um, uh, we've gone through today all of the key components of a uh, SANS instrument from the source, uh, through the optics and guides that are used to transport uh, the neutrons, different ways of selecting the wavelengths that we want or blocking the wavelengths we don't want, uh, ways of detecting neutrons, be it so we can make measurements of the beam flux in a beam monitor or measure the scattering as a function of Q in an area detector, uh, how we do collimation and the effects that has on uh, the flux we get on our sample, the minimum Q we can measure and the resolution of the measurement, how well we can measure the angle. And also then we've talked about shielding and why we need it and the different types of materials we can use. And I just want to finish by reminding you that um, fundamentally, this is the equation that governs how we set up and design a SANS instrument. Uh, the length scale we can measure is determined by the Q value we can measure. And that Q value is determined by the wavelength we can uh, transport to the sample and the angles at which we can measure scattering. So with that, I'm happy to take a few questions for the last few minutes. Hello. Uh, have, have you ever come across any uh, computer program that can be used to simulate the uh, neutron absorption cross-section or a <laughs> range of, if so, can you please recommend one? Um, so uh, it is actually quite tricky. Um, so we can, um, I mean, all of the neutron absorption cross sections are tabulated. Um, and so in theory, one could can do a fairly straightforward Monte Carlo approach to firing neutron rays in and determining what their interaction is. In fact, the package McSnass, uh, I believe, can be used to uh, make such calculations. Um, but actually, in terms of just for simple geometries, one can fairly straightforwardly write some, some Monte Carlo routine mm -hmm. to, to do that if you know the materials properties. Um, if, you're just, if you're interested just in uh, what the transmission of a given um, component will be given its um, composition, then you don't even need to do a simulation. You can do a uh, an attenuation coefficient calculation. Um, okay. I can point you to, to how to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's a fairly straightforward equation you can plug numbers into. I've got a spreadsheet you can borrow if you like. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about this uh, wavelengths or this uh, number of values. Uh, yeah. Let's say if you want to study a metal material that contains the different uh, phases, mm -hmm. they, they, they have a different uh, despacing values. Yes. So how, how should we consider that? I mean, choose a one or choose a number? Uh, 
Right. So, so in general, the despacing doesn't affect the signal you'll see on SANS, right? I mean, we, we're looking at length scales longer than that, and we thus take the average scattering length density of each of the phases. So what you will get from the SANS measurement is generally things like um, grain size, uh, distribution of the phases, phase uh, quantity, so what fraction is in one phase or another, um, these type of measurements. Um, you won't be directly getting uh, information about the, um, uh, the, the crystal structure of those. That said, there are measurements you can make um, if, you're, if you can do um, uh, sort of brag edge type measurements where you um, move over a, a, an edge where you then enhance the brag scattering and so reduce transmission. Uh, you can look at transmission dips in your spectrum and that can tell you about the the phases, of course, in general, you'll be you'll be looking at a powder, so rather than a single crystal, but um, yep. but you can get information about the phases that way as well. But that's a slightly more advanced measurement. That by that I mean that's a Bragg age measurement, yeah. right? Yeah, the, exactly. Yes, yeah. the yeah. spectra. Okay. I have another question about this uh, again, and I'm just curious about the sensitivity. You know, when we detect some small amount of stuff in uh, complicated materials. So is it better to have a larger number of neutrons? So it's always better to have more neutrons. Um, you can never have too many by and large. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 in terms of sensitivity, it's actually, um, once you're over a certain threshold for, for, for background, um, then uh, for, for instrumental background, then it's really driven by the properties of the sample. So depending upon what the major phase is, that will be the major contributor to your background signal. And so really it then comes down to how big the scattering contrast is between your minor phase and your ma major phase as to uh, whether you would see it. And there, more neutrons generally won't help you. It'll just help you realize you're not getting a signal faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, uh... Small question also about the spallation source. Like the pulses are have a much higher flux than uh, like uh, continuous yes uh, fission source, right? So I was just wondering if uh, even if the average flux is the same, is your background also then much lower? So it because your be. signal to noise during the pulse should be yeah exactly that, much that's, higher, a, right? yeah, that's a good observation. And in fact, actually, that's one of the major advantages of spallation sources is the fact yeah. that you're generally measuring while the source is off. So, yeah. so, so as long as, as long as there is nothing, so as long as your source is well shielded close to it, so the monolith shielding is good. Um, so you're not getting, say, neutrons that come out, reflect off the ceiling of the of the hall, get moderated in your shielding, and then end yeah. up in your detector. Um, then, which is can be a problem. Then, then it should be very quiet uh, from the source background term while you're measuring. And so the dominant term yeah. should be. With a well-designed source and instrument, the dominant term should be just coming from um, instrumental com instrument components and the sample. Yeah, and so that could potentially nice. be a lot quieter than a than a reactor source. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's uh, never thought about. That. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Ah, here we are. Uh, that was the question. Oh, yeah, those are the two questions that have just been asked. They were in text in the chat already. I didn't see them. Okay. Um, any other questions about uh, the things that we spoke about today? If not, then uh, I'll wrap up and uh, uh, see you uh, tomorrow. <laughs>